Third factor, momentum. Mass times velocity. How fast are you moving? Difficult to deal with. Why? You put on your orthotics, you walk over to the curb, notice it's raining, and run to your car. Do you change your orthotics at the curb? No. So you need an orthotic that will resist a range of forces that we call activities of daily living. But what if you're a competitive athlete? What if you're a lineman for the Broncos? You're pushing with legs that can push with 1,500 pounds against another guy who can push with 1,500 pounds. You need a lot more force. The extreme case, we made orthotics for the world's strongest man. The guy weighs 400. He deadlifts 1,000. He needed an orthotic that would resist 1,400 pounds. It was hard as a rock. He couldn't stand to wear it around the mall. So what did he have to do? Get a second pair that was calibrated to his mere 400 pounds. Calibrated. That's the key word. If you're going to go this high in the arch, it will be extremely uncomfortable, intolerable, and that's why we failed with many orthotics early on, if you don't calibrate the correct amount of force. So I brought together a team of engineers. I have five engineers that work for me. And we spent nine years in conjunction with the Vanderbilt University Biomedical Engineering Department. We had five interns rotating through. And over a nine-year period, we went through numerous permutations. Finally, the answer came to me when I was helping my son with his physics homework. We were studying Pascal's law. Pressure inside of an enclosed container is equivalent in all directions. And suddenly a light went off. We have to put it in an enclosed container. So we made a three-quarter inch steel container with a bladder over the orthotic, a digital encoder under the orthotic, and every two thousandths of an inch of motion, we measured pressure, distance, pressure, distance, pressure, distance. Gave you an Excel file, which you could graph. That graph is called a force curve. The force curve gives you the property, the flexibility of a material. Actually, the slope of the force curve is its flexibility. We then took the slopes of thousands of force curves and plotted them in a scatter graph. Eliminated the warranties. The trend line gave us a mathematical formula that if you take body weight and foot flexibility, I can tell you the range of forces the correct slope of the force curve for the range of forces for activities of daily living. This changed our life. We ran about a 20% failure rate until we developed this. Now we have a 0.9% failure rate. 0.9. Why? Measurement. For the first time, there's a, the ability to calibrate every single orthotic and we do when you go full contact in the mass position you know what you've just done you've eliminated impact why the foot doesn't have to drop down to hit the orthotic because it's already touching it once you've eliminated impact you now can apply an enormously greater corrective force because you're not banging it against the bottom of the foot and that's what we did we applied a much greater corrective force. Isn't, I was asked during the break, isn't that going to cause ankle sprains raising the arch that high? Uh, the exact opposite. Why? Because when you, when you use your muscles to lift the arch, you definitely transfer the force laterally. But when you use the orthotic, the force is transferred medially. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction moving medially. As you move the force medial to the foot, you decrease the incidence of ankle sprains. The supinated foot we know is a more stable foot. With the force moved medially, reduces ankle sprains. And this is why I was asked to speak for the Major League Soccer Association. And now many of the Major League Soccer teams, including the Olympic team, have switched to this technology. You've also reduced shearing force because now the skin and the plastic stay together. 
You don't have shearing between the skin and the plastic. So how much correction do you want anyone to have? The answer is this. I would like each individual foot to have the maximal amount of correction that that individual person could tolerate with their anatomy without overcorrecting and causing new problems. That turns out to be the mass position. So we had to reinvent casting. We referenced casting to two things. First, we referenced it to the gait cycle. We wanted the maximal arch you could tolerate at mid-stance. So we put the foot in mid-stance, the leg vertical. Then we passed weight in a series of steps through the foot in as close to the ideal gait cycle as each individual foot could tolerate with its anatomy. We were able to recreate the uncompensated geometry of the foot. But we also referenced it to the floor. Hanging it out in space had no frame of reference, no repeatability. But when you push every step of the technique pushing to the supporting surface, you will always push them to the floor, never through the floor. Last January's JAPMA, they took people who were doing 50 to 100 plaster casts a month for 2 to 20 years and gave them 10 minutes of instruction in our technique. And the same doctor, same patient reliability was 67% better with this technique. That's pretty huge. Why? Frame of reference. The other thing missed was soft tissue compression. Hang the foot out in space, all the soft tissues round out. What do you end up with? About a quarter of an inch too much soft tissue. But when they wear the orthotic, it will compress the soft tissues, right? You lose a quarter of an inch. In orthotic arch height, that's huge. That's massive. So you want a material that when you're doing the cast will evenly compress all the soft tissues. So we experimented with various materials and found out that we needed to use our own foam. Biofoam is a 2.25 PSI foam. We had to drop it to a 1.75 PSI foam to make it work. To go in at this depth, at three full inches, to make it tolerable by the human body, you had to drop it to 1.75. So we had to reinvent the foam casting box in its density only to get soft tissue compression. Now I'm going to kill another sacred cow. When I was in school, they said, orthotics are either functional or accommodative? I disagree. I was taught that accommodative is soft and functional is rigid. Accommodative to me as an engineer means this. Accommodation means the redistribution of plantar pressure, force per unit area, evenly over the entire plantar surface of the foot. Distribute the force evenly, you have accommodation. That's why you can lie on a bed of nails, but you can't lie on one nail, right? Automatically going full contact, calibrated in the mass position with soft tissue compression gives you accommodation. So this is automatically, regardless of arch height, regardless of anything, is the most accommodative orthotic ever made. Period. It's the reason why the number one treatment for neurotropic ulcers is full contact plaster casting. How can you put rigid plaster against the delicate skin of a diabetic? Because you reduce the force per unit area over the plantar surface. So it heals. Functional is a different animal. Functional is not a property of an orthotic. Functional is a property of the foot. What do I mean? If you give me a foot that's flexible enough that I can change its posture, I can change its function. So function is a property of the foot, is on a gradient scale between flexible foot and rigid foot. Accommodation we can always achieve. So there, I would say there is no accommodative and functional orthotics. There are accommodative orthotics and functional changes that can occur in the foot.